Well, you are right. A campaign can require a lot of wardrobe changes. We uh, blue jeans in the morning, perhaps a uh, suit uh, for a lunch fundraiser, sport coat for dinner. But it's nice to finally relax and uh, to wear what Ann and I wear around the house. <laughs> it's a message what I, which I'm going to carry and continue to carry, which is: look, the, the president's approach is attractive to people who aren't not paying taxes because, frankly, my discussion about lowering taxes isn't as attractive to them and therefore I'm not likely to draw them into my campaign. My campaign is about the 100 percent in America and I'm concerned about them. I have a record. I've demonstrated my capacity to help the 100 percent. Obamacare was bad policy yesterday. It's bad policy today. I have experience in health care reform. Uh, now and then the president says I'm the grandfather of Obamacare. I don't think he meant that as a compliment but I'll take it. I believe we should have a federal amendment of the Constitution that defines marriage as a relationship between a man and a woman. Because I believe the ideal place to raise a child is in a home with a mom and a dad. I love my children and I love my grandchildren and, uh, and I would of course want them to be happy. My, my view is this, that, that individuals uh, should be able to uh, pursue a relationship of love and respect and raise a family as they would choose humans tend to think of ourselves or identities as continuous, but as we've just seen, one's identity changes drastically from situation to situation, even to the point of contradicting itself. According to research ranging across several disciplines, identity is composed of multiple parts or even multiple discrete identities. This idea is supported by sociology, linguistics, anthropology, and psychology, essentially any area that studies how we interact in groups. By showing how malleable we are to the situation and the group we're with, these scientists and social scientists have effectively demonstrated how flimsy our individual selves are. It leads us to wonder whether we've really just manufactured the idea of a continuous self, and why that idea is so important to us. First, let's take a look at identity through the perspective of linguistic anthropology. Governor Romney is once again a perfect example. When he speaks to a different audience, he doesn't just change his message, he changes his presentation. Linguistic anthropology divides this change in the way he speaks into two separate types of actions. Practice is the simple daily repetition of speech acts. One's practice may change based on context, but this is not usually a conscious decision. Instead, people adjust their speaking styles out of habit. Performance, on the other hand, is a highly deliberate and self-aware social display. In performance, subjects actively try to shape how others view them. They may stylize or enhance certain aspects of the way they speak in order to fit in with a certain group. Romney may consciously be performing the role of American businessman, but if we still think he seems greasy, it may be that he is still practicing the role of politician in ways that he doesn't even notice. Because of the setting of a debate or speech, for example, he may be speaking in a particularly smooth or articulate way that signals the ideology of politician to us, but over which he has no control. These are elements of his identity, but what elements are displayed is dependent on context. Each of these is an example of the fact that, consciously or not, we all attempt to modulate our behaviors to fit with the people around us. Some of the most disturbing experiments in psychology have been concerned with this idea, conformity. One such experiment was known as the third wave, it was conducted by Ron Jones, a high school teacher at Coverly High School in California in 1967. As his contemporary world history class was studying Nazi Germany, Jones decided to show the class firsthand how the Nazis had taken over Germany, without telling them just what was going on. Thus began the third wave movement, with the motto, strength through discipline, strength through community, strength through action, and strength through pride. The experiment quickly got out of control. Even Jones reported getting caught up in the wave. By the fifth day, the students had become completely loyal to him. Jones knew he had to end the experiment. He announced that the students were to have a rally where a national spokesman of the movement would start the next phase of the wave. There is no leader, is there? Well, yes, there is. There's your leader. There is no 
no national youth movement. You thought you were so special, better than everyone outside this room. You traded your freedom for the luxury of feeling superior. You accepted the group's will over your own conviction, no matter who you hurt. Oh, you thought you were just going along for the ride, that you could walk away at any moment. But where were you heading? How far would you have gone? The experiment ended after the students realized what they had become. In less than a week, the students and their peers had completely changed their identity. As Mr. Jones showed in his classroom, our peers and leaders can change not only what we do, but their and how we feel. This effect is even more pronounced when it comes to a group with which we actually associate ourselves, not just a group of strangers. Social identity theory states that when an individual is with a group that they perceive themselves to be a part of, they will take extraordinary measures to, one, solidify their rank or position in the group, two, increase their status of the group, and three, exclude others from the group. By making oneself a clear member of a group, and by increasing the group's status, one can increase one's personal social standing, sense of pride, and sense of belonging. And in order to enhance the image of the group, members will actively discriminate against others, because this discrimination divides the world into an in-group and an out-group, inherently assigning superiority to the in-group. This applies to groups such as family, sports teams, and social classes. Even more frighteningly, the same processes can occur along the lines of national or religious identity. Samuel Huntington, a conservative political scientist in his last book, Who Are We? The Challenges to America's National Identity, argued that America was a direct combination of national and religious identities, no matter how secular its citizens became. In other words, America was a nation with the soul of a church. Huntington's argument was that the American dream and the hard work ethic associated with it were part of our Protestant history. Huntington's theories are controversial, but he raises an interesting question. How far can identity shape us? And even further, is America really based on the ideas of the first Protestant settlers? Regardless of how true Huntington's answers are to these questions, national and religious identity can have a tremendous impact on us without us even noticing. Like the students in the third wave experiment, we so closely hold to the belief that our identity is continuous and under our control that we become oblivious to external forces. Whether that force be our teacher, religion, or national leaders. Given the idea that we are not internally unified beings, it's tempting to ask whether we really have multiple identities or whether they are multiple facets of the same identity. These are really just different names for the same thing, yet we tend to see them as radically different ideas. We prefer the idea of filling many roles, while it's culturally considered a weakness to be multiple people. Just think of accusations such as you're a totally different person when you're with her. It's clear we have a cultural preference for internal unity. This may stem in part from the emphasis that Abrahamic religions place on the self as an individual actor. Christianity, for example, places value on the idea that by performing well or poorly, an individual earns eternal reward or punishment. This is not so in every religion. In Buddhism, there is a strong emphasis on the illusory nature of self, but from a Western cultural background, one in which one is expected to be eternally accountable for all of one's actions, it is easy to see why we might cling to the idea that all of our actions are made by the same actor, a unified self. The contradiction between a unified identity and multiple identities provides us with a lens not just to evaluate individuals on the social level, but to analyze how entire nations mobilize their citizens to action. Such mobilization of human energy can occur for the sake of a genocide, as seen in Nazi Germany, or for the sake of opportunity through the American hard work ethic. Linguistically, we also change not just our tone, but the very things we say, depending on the group that is around us. Politicians are not the only groups of people who are guilty of such identity changes. Most of us do it unintentionally, altering our actions and thereby our beliefs based on the context. These changes demonstrate how fractured our internal selves really are, leading us to question how we ever manage to feel like unified people from minute to minute, or convince ourselves that our thoughts are ours.